G'day and salutations. Today's briefing, China's J-15B Super Shark. What should we expect? Well, the PLA Navy, the plan, had been operating the J-15A Flying Shark off its Stobar carriers for over 10 years. The imminent introduction of a Catabar carrier has required modifications to it, with additional upgrades also needed to make it a platform capable of operating in the 2030s. This briefing will cover the known and likely improvements over the existing J-15A, including structure, engines, sensors and weapons. Then look at some of the notional weapons loadouts for different mission profiles. And finally, why the J-15B covers an important role within a planned carrier air wing. Note the designation of this new version is not confirmed and it could be referred to as the J-15T. Structurally, given the aircraft is already stressed to conduct carrier landings, the significant change is to the forward landing gear, with modifications including a strengthened nose landing gear and catapult launch bar. Note the J-15A can actually take off with maximum payload under certain conditions on China's Stobar carriers. While not required in terms of being able to launch from a catapult, the J-15B has been seen with a new marinized indigenous engine, replacing the Russian AL-31 in the J-15A. The engine is a version of the WS-10 fitted to the J-16, with performance around 132 to 135 kilonewtons, or about 30,350 pounds of thrust, so approximately 10 kilonewtons more powerful than the AL-31. Now, if the suggested engine lag performance has been overcome, we might also see the J-15B operating off the Liaoning and Shandong. Although, as I suggested in previous videos, the J-35 might be a better option for those carriers. One of the benefits of the flanker shell is its large radome, allowing the fitting of a large and powerful radar. It is likely a new active electronically scanned array, AESA radar, will be installed. If not exactly the same as that found on the J-16, then very similar. Shown here is a possible image of the J-16's AESA radar. I can't vouch for its accuracy, but it's within the realms of possibility. This suggests a gallium arsenide based AESA with 1760 transmit receive modules. Installation of a AESA radar on the J-15B will provide a number of benefits, including greater resistance to jamming and lower probability of intercept. AESA radars can actively track a, num- a large number of targets, can prioritise and scan around the first detection, build track information and give a higher quality track at range. With this new radar, the j 15 B will be able to make full use of the PLA's most capable weapons, including air-to-air missiles, carried on as many as 12 weapon stations. These air-to-air missiles include the PL-10 within visual range missile with helmet-mounted sight compatibility and a range of around 20 kilometres. Also, the PL-15 beyond visual range missile, which is fitted with an active radar seeker and has a range of over 200 kilometres both seen here on a J-20. The J-15B might also be equipped with the PL-17 Very Long Range Air-to-Air Missile. This is also fitted with an active radar seeker and has a range of around 400 kilometres depending on launch altitude. It has been seen on the J-16 and it would provide a significant range advantage for the J-15B in air-to-air combat. In terms of surface strike weapons, the J-15B will likely employ those weapons already found on the J-15A and J-16. For maritime strike, this would be the YJ-83K, which has a 165 kilogram warhead and a range of over 200 kilometers. For land strike missions, the KD-88 will likely be the primary weapon employed, again with a 165 kilogram warhead and range of over 200 kilometres. 
It is possible the J-15B will also be capable of launching the YJ-12 long-range supersonic anti-ship missile. Seen here on a JH-7, it has a range of around 400 kilometres, depending on launch altitude, and represents a far more serious threat to ships than the YJ-83K. So a notional weapons loadout for long-range air warfare, not combat air patrol, could be as follows. Two PL-10 within visual range air-to-air missiles. Two PL-15 beyond visual range air-to-air missiles. Four PL-17 long-range air-to-air missiles. And one 2,000 litre external fuel tank. This might deliver a combat radius of around 1,600 kilometres, depending on flight profile, together with the approximately 400 kilometre range of the PL-17s, allowing the J-15B to reach out to around 2,000 kilometres, or 1,080 nautical miles. For surface strike, whether maritime or land, a notional weapons loadout might include two PL-10 within visual range air-to-air missiles, two PL-15 beyond visual range air-to-air missiles, two KJ-83Ks or KD-88 for land targets, and one 2,000 litre external fuel tank. This might deliver a combat radius exceeding 1,500 kilometres, depending on flight profile, together with a range of around 200 kilometres for the KJ-83Ks, allowing it to reach out to approximately 1,800 kilometres or 970 nautical miles. This could be extended to around 2,000 kilometres and 1,080 nautical miles if the YJ-12 is carried. There are other options the plan might develop to get maximum benefit from this investment in developing a catapult launch version of the J-15. It is very likely that the J-15B will, like its predecessor, be able to conduct buddy tanker refueling. As for the foreseeable future at least, there are no other options to deliver this requirement. This would provide important increases to mission range and endurance profiles. One option that is very likely to be developed, and which would act as an enabler for the standard fighter strike version, is an electronic warfare, or EW version. Given there is already an EW version of the existing J-15A, and the importance of this capability, we should expect to see an EW version of the B model. As with its predecessor, we should expect the removal of its internal gun and the addition of wingtip pods for electronic intelligence. If the two-seat EW version is developed, it is possible that this variant could form the basis of a de dedicated strike and drone controller aircraft. Such a version, in theory, should offer the same capability as that of the land-based J-16, possibly working together with a navalised version of the GJ-11 UCAV. Other aircraft that would act as enablers for the J-15B would include a carrier-based KJ-600 airborne early warning and control aircraft. Operating at an altitude of over 10,000 metres or 33,000 feet and with an endurance of likely around six hours, its three triangular configured AESA radars will help cue the J-15Bs to potential targets before the J-15's own radars take over. Land-based enablers might include the WZ-9 Divine Eagle UAV. It features a novel twin fuselage design with twin large vertical tail fins and an extra long main wing extending across the rear fuselage. This is possibly a specialised airborne early warning platform, but designed to work with other manned aircraft to detect stealth aircraft by way of a wide band electronically scanned radar, providing long range but with lower accuracy than other radars. Some specifications include an endurance of over 20 hours and a ceiling of around 18,000 metres or 60,000 feet. In summary, the new J-15B should be a very capable platform, essentially a single-seat catapult launch version of the J-16. With an AESA radar, more powerful engines, able to employ the latest air-to-air missiles, and no longer payload limited on launch, 
all the identified deficiencies of the J15 have been addressed. The plan will now be able to utilise the J15 to its full capability, including its significant kinematic performance and large internal fuel capacity. The J15 fulfils a complementary role to that of the future J35, and it is unlikely to be fully replaced by it. The resources allocated to its development, concurrent with the development of the J35, indicate as such. When complemented by the J35, the plan will possess a capable mix of long-range, large payload fourth-generation aircraft, together with a stealthy fifth-generation fighter-strike aircraft. That concludes today's briefing. Thank you for watching. Happy to take suggestions for future briefings from subscribers, so please subscribe, like and share. Until next time, Vale de Cerro.